Right, I wanted to start uh, this to work. Uh, just given the weather we have outside and the number of people say, well, you know, how can you believe in global warming when it's just absolutely freezing out there? And, and the question is, what do you think the difference between the warmest January mean temperature at Dublin Airport and the coldest mean temperature uh, at Dublin Airport since 1958, which is when records began? Any idea how big that range is? Anybody like to ha hazard, just hazard a guess? For January, yep. Yeah. So, what's the difference between the, the coldest mean temperature January recorded in January and the uh, uh, mean temperature over the month, and the warmest mean temperature? Just to set a perspective and things, because it uh, gives some insight into some of the questions that people often ask. Four degrees. No, that's that's not bad. A bit more. It's about seven. In fact. I can get this to work. The coldest temperature at Dublin was 0.9 degrees in 1963, um, and the warmest was 7.8 in 1989. So that's a range of about seven degrees. If you look at summer, the warmest was uh, over that period, 13.9 in 1962, 17.7 in 1995. So a smaller, about seven in winter range, and about four in uh, summer. And if you look at the Central England Temperature Series, which goes back to 1654 or something, um, you will see a similar range, uh, probably a bit more in winter, uh, probably about eight in winter, and I think a similar uh, range in summer. And you've got to remember that, because that means that you know, each winter we've got that range of about seven degrees over the last hundred years or so. The change in global mean temperature over that period has only been about half a degree. So you're not, year to year, going to be aware of that small increase in global temperature. So what was going on last year? I think it was, I think it was about, last year, temperature was about three degrees below normal in, in January. And I don't know if you can see this or not. This is a map of the world. And it shows the temperature anomalies in January 2010 relative to the 61 to 90 mean. And you can see that most of this is red. And in fact, if you remember, half the globe is between 30 north and 30 south. A great majority of the globe, actually, last year was warmer, much warmer than average. What was interesting there was this narrow band of colder than average temperatures, a little bit over Washington, uh, through Europe, and right round and down to China. And the reason for that was that last year, uh, certainly in this region, the winds are usually southwesterly, southerly or westerly, but we had a predominance of northerly or easterly winds which uh, certainly for the British Isles was bringing cold air off the continent. And it's those circulation changes which vary from year to year give you this huge range. And that's why when you look outside, you shouldn't be surprised to see snow even though the global mean temperature is going up. I think last year was probably, uh, this year looks like being one of the warmest in three on record. So that's, if you like, the difference between weather and climate. Weather gives you the variation year to year and climate is a long-term trend. Just to have a look at uh, last, this was the last week in November, you can see we've got a very similar pattern. So that's what's happening at the moment. Again, much warmer than average through the center of Asia, over much of Africa and so on. And again, this warm or cold band through Northern Europe, Siberia, and down into China. So it's a very similar situation. And in fact, I suspect that a lot of the change we've seen over the British Isles in the last 30 or 40 years uh, where we've had uh, milder winters, probably wetter winters, is as much to do with a prevalence of southwesterly winds as opposed to northerly or easterly winds, uh, because the change has actually been too big to be explained by the, 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 the wider range in temperature. So I think a, a lot of the theme of my talk is this thing about the interaction between weather and climate. Weather is this highly variable thing which you see locally. Climate is a long-term trend. And it gives rise to a lot of confusion uh, when people look out and say, well, it doesn't look very warm out there. So um, the outline of my talk, I'm going to talk, first of all, about what we know. And I think one of the lessons for me of ClimateGate is that um, I still think there's not a very good understanding of the basic science of climate change. Because I was horrified how many people were set back in their confidence in what science was saying. And I think it's because a lot of people just hadn't really taken on board the basics. And it's very hard to argue against people when they say, well, you know, 
the scientists have rigged this or whatever, if you don't have the evidence. And I want to talk about the evidence rather than opinions. So say a little bit about what we know, um, then what we think we know. So these are things, the top is as certain as you can be. As somebody said, the only things that are certain in life are death and taxes. So it's getting into that area. This is things that, well, you know, pretty certain of. Then I want to say something about recent predictions and then just some final remarks. So what we know, um, well, the first thing is we know carbon dioxide is increasing. And this shows concentrations of the last 400,000 years as measured in Antarctica, going between about 170 and 300 parts per million. And these, I say, are taken from ice cores. And in fact, they now go back seven or 800 years. And these periods here, the peaks, are what we call the interglacial. We're in an interglacial at the moment. And these are the uh, ice ages. And in fact, one of the things that Al Gore got wrong about this, we think in this period, temperature was driving changes in carbon dioxide. But what you see recently, this shows measurements from here to here in ice cores, and then at Mauna Loa, which is a site in the middle of the Pacific. And you can see this has been unprecedented rise and an unprecedented rate of rise in the last 100 or so years. And I've also put on an indication of what that might be by 2100, anywhere between 500 and I guess 900 be up here somewhere. So there's no doubt that uh, human emissions are leading to the increase in carbon dioxide. In fact, we know that we, can, we know how much is being emitted, and countries aren't in the business of trying to exaggerate how much CO2 they're emitting at, the, at present, for obvious reasons. And only about half the CO2 that is, has been emitted has stayed in the atmosphere. The rest has been uh, stored in the oceans. Now, there's a, there's a lot that we don't understand about carbon and how it changes, but what we're sure of is that the dominant factor in this increase is, is human activity. The second thing is people really annoy me when they talk about greenhouse theory as if it was, you know, our arsenal is going to be top of the league at the year I've got a theory about it. Um, this is a well-established uh, physical phenomenon. Uh, we know if you double carbon dioxide, oops, getting ahead of myself, um, you would get a warming of about one degree. And that's simple classical physics. Uh, for those of you who are physicists, it's the uh, Stefan Boltzmann equation. So doubling CO2 gives you about a flux of about four watts per square at the top of the atmosphere. Very simple to work out what temperature change would be. Where it becomes a bit more difficult is how the atmosphere would then change and how that would amplify or reduce the original warming. And probably the best known feedback is if you've got a warmer atmosphere, you're going to have more water vapor. Water vapor is actually the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and we expect that to almost double the sensitivity. That's based on physical evidence, modeling, analog evidence. It's not quite as certain as the top bit. Then where the real uncertainties come in is uh, through uh, the feedback through sea ice and clouds, which both reflect and trap radiation, and that's where the real uncertainty comes. And that's why you'll see a range of answers for predictions. So that's physics of the greenhouse effect. Now, the next thing was the global average temperature record. And this is up to, I've chosen this. I have a later one, but I wanted one that went right back. And this is the temperatures that UEA and the Hadley Center put together. Hadley Center do the ocean temperatures, UEA do the land record. And I don't know if you can see at the back, but there are actually uncertainty bars in each of these. Each red bar is the annual mean temperature anomaly. Uh, we use anomalies because it's uh, a much more accurate way of looking at it. And you can see uh, the warming over the last 110 years or so, a period of rapid warming in the middle, of the early part of the last century, a period of little change, and then a more rapid uh, period of warming. And you can also see a uh, couple of interesting years. For example, in 1998, we had a very big what's known as El Nino. This is a phenomenon in the tropical Pacific where you get a huge warming right around the tropics, and that's why that particular year was so warm. And then this uh, period when we've seen uh, we haven't actually got back to that total yet, or we might make that this year. So that's why some people have looked at this and said, well, temperature has been decreasing. The blue line is a running average, which is probably a better way to look at this, because just like the temperatures in Dublin Airport, you get a lot of year-to-year -year variability. So one warm year doesn't mean one warming, and one cold year doesn't mean we're not having it. Now, one of the things that Climate did was to query uh, just how reliable this particular record was. And to me, one of the most convincing bits of evidence that they haven't cooked, you know, chosen 
sites that are affected by urbanization and hence have a warm bias and so on, is to separate out three independent data sets. Now, we've got actually four different global data sets, but they all tend to use the same data. We do one, uh, NASA do one, NOAA do one, and I think there's a Russian one. But this is separating out into the land and uh, the sea surface, which is in blue. And then we also have a set of measurements taken on ships' decks, so that's the marine air temperature. Now, the land temperature, we might expect to have a slight warm bias, but in fact, we also expect land to warm fa faster than the sea, so this is probably sensible. The ocean temperatures probably may have a warm bias because they've gone from measuring sea surface temperature in a bucket to measuring an intake temperatures to the engine. And of course, the engine tends to heat it up slightly. Now, all these things we try and correct for. But for me, the, the killer argument is that the marine air temperature, because ships have get, been getting higher, there should be, a, if you like, a cold bias in those temperatures. And you can see they all show the same broad uh, pattern of change in global mean temperature over the last three years. So for this, this, for me, is probably the most convincing bit of evidence that the, the, the planet has been warming. We've got loads of other evidence. I don't know if you can see all these. Um, I just need to stand here to read them. So this is atmospheric temperatures. We put up uh, weather balloons every day, and you can see there's a warming. These only go from about the late 50s. Uh, this is seven data sets, four data sets of land surface temperatures, which I told you about, uh, all pretty well in agreement. Sea surface temperature, six data sets. Sea level, of course, if you're warming the ocean, it expands. Um, and, uh, and you can see that all these six data sets showing expanding. Uh, specific humidity, in other words, the water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing. And then other things which are going down, the uh, stratospheric temperatures, which are showing we're getting our radiation model right, if you like, they go down. The uh, northern hemisphere, uh, snow cover, uh, Arctic September sea ice, and this one I think, I can't read that one, I think it's mass balance over glaciers. So you can see all these independent indicators showing warming. So that, that's why we're pretty sure of that. Um, now I'm going to say something about models because there are two groups of scientists we have trouble with. One is the geologists because they look at the past record and say climate's always changed, what's the difference about this change? And I've tried to explain that because we're putting in CO2 so rapidly, we're seeing a rise in carbon dioxide, which we've never seen before. All right. The other is economists. And I think you just have to look at the economist's record for predicting the economy to understand why they don't trust models. <laughs> now, I'm not say necessarily saying you should implicitly trust climate models either, but they're based on the laws of classical physics, conservation of mass, conservation of heat, energy, water, and so on. Uh, Navier-Stokes equations, and if you talk to Ray Bates, he'll tell you a lot about those. He's an expert in that. So these are the you know, basic uh, laws of classical physics. Um, there are some empirical aspects. We don't have equations for how clouds form and dissipate. So we have to, there is some empiricism based on observations, uh, on our understanding of the physics, and uh, using some finer scale models to try and model what's happening on. So that, if you like, is the Achilles heel of, of climate models. Uh, they're tested against weather forecasting, against recent climate, and past climates. Now, none of these tests will, are definitive in the sense that we know we can have absolute confidence in the models. But we've tried to explain people who do energy forecasting, economic forecasting, to go back and say, well, if you took your model at 1950 and ran it forward, how much would it explain? We've actually done that. Uh, so that's why we have, we believe our models are better than the Commodus. Apologies to Mark here, you know, as an economist. Economics is much more difficult, let's face it. Um, and I think the final thing is that they're sometimes useful. In fact, there's a quote by Box, who was a statistician, who said, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And you've got to bear that in mind, particularly when you're looking at regional changes. Just to say that climate models are not wholly empirical, and they're not statistical fits to past data. And these seem to be misunderstandings that are quite prevalent among the public. So the second thing I want to say about models oops, um, is how we use them. So we put together models of the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, and we can start them off with just a still atmosphere and a still ocean and run them. And they start to generate features of climate that we see. This is showing uh, a model run where we've just taken the global model. This is the global mean temperature anomalies over a period of about 1,000 years. And you can see the model generates its own variability. Um, just to give you an idea what the observations look like, that's the observations from, I guess, 1900 up to about 2000. 
Um, so you get the impression that the degree of variability is, is probably about right. If we were to run this model in a different computer, you get the same sort of behavior, but these peaks wouldn't appear in the same place. Because essentially, these are manifestations of weather, how climate varies from year to year, rather than long term. Then what we would do, this, this is without any change in greenhouse gases. We could then start to increase greenhouse gases, go back to here, and what you'd see that this envelope of variability would slowly start to rise up until, you know, if you put enough greenhouse gases, you can then very clearly distinguish between the temperature changes due to greenhouse gases and this natural variability. And that, to me, is one of the most difficult problems in climate science, is distinguishing between this sort of natural variability and what's forced by increases in greenhouse gases due to human activity. So that's models. Now on to things that uh, we think we know. Um, the first thing is trying to explain the last 100 years. And this shows a set of simulations from 1900 up to 2000. Uh, the black curve is the observations. Uh, and the, I don't know if you can see the sort of cloud of yellow curves. And those are from something like 20 different models. And what you can see is that um, so a certain number of features in common. We had a big volcano here which led to cooling. Another one, El Shishon, 1983, Pinatubo in particular. And you can see that to some extent in the observations. When you take out greenhouse gases and just include things like volcanoes and uh, the natural factors alone, you don't get this warming. And that's one piece of evidence that uh, the recent warming is due to the increase in greenhouse gases. That's a very simplified picture of what we actually do. We look at the patterns. If this was due to solar variability, we probably wouldn't expect to see a marked cooling in the stratosphere and a warming underneath. Uh, volcanoes have a different pattern. So we look at the spatial patterns, the vertical patterns, and those are what gives it the confidence that most of this warming is due to increases in greenhouse gases. So that's attribution. Um, the other thing we use models for is prediction. And this shows. Um, the results of, a, again, I think 19 different models have been used in this. And you can see a red, a green, and a blue curve. And those are three different emission scenarios. This goes something from like 8 gigatons of carbon to 30 gigatons of carbon a year. This one goes from 8, and I think it comes back down to 5. And this spread is a spread because different models will give different results. Similarly, the green spread and the red spread. Two points to make from this very important. The first is that because of inertia in the system, inertia in changing carbon dioxide concentrations, inertia in the ocean, it doesn't matter very much what you do in the first two to three years, two to three decades. And the message from that is that we are going to have to adapt to a certain amount of climate change. And I think this has become much more on the political agenda than it has been in the past. So uh, even if assuming that we can bring you know, emissions down back down to five gigatons a year, uh, you're still going to see substantial warming. The second thing, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter what you do. The second lesson is that by the time you get to the end of a century, it does make a big difference on the emissions. And it's a bit like paying off your mortgage. The first you know, few years paying off your mortgage, it doesn't break very much to the principal that's left. But as you get towards the end of it, it happens very quickly. So the second thing is, what we do now makes a difference in the longer term. Uh, and that's, that's very important from a policy point of view. So getting back to a bit closer to what's happening locally, this shows temperatures, summer temperatures over southern Europe. The black curve are observations, and they go up to 2003 for obvious reasons. This was a very hot summer they had, particularly in France. Uh, it's more in southern Europe than in Britain. And you can see there's about a two degree anomaly uh, in that summer temperature. And shown on top of this are about three different simulations uh, using one of the Hadley Center models and then a medium emission scenario. Two things we've learned from this. First of all, we think this summer was probably twice as likely to happen because of the increase in greenhouse gases than would have happened if we hadn't had the increase in greenhouse gases. You can't blame this on global warming. You can just say it's more likely or less likely to have occurred. And the second thing is, you can see by the time, this shows sort of the year-to-year -year variability. We're talking about the temperatures in Dublin, how these things vary. It's a range of about, I think in this summer temperatures, about two degrees. Um, and you can see by the time you get to the middle of the century, this summer would be a sort of average summer. And by the end, it would actually be a cool summer. And that's a much more, if you like, striking indication of what a two-degree change would be or a four-degree change. Because it doesn't sound a lot when 
winter can vary between you know, a range of seven degrees, summer can range of four degrees in present climate. Um, okay, so getting on to some of the things that we're not so sure of. Uh, and I, I was at a meeting of the Royal Society a few months ago and a lady asked me, was I a catastrophist? And I'm not, <laughs> I'll assure you that. Uh, but, and the difficulty we have as climate scientists is that we can't ignore these things because they're possible. Because if we do, I think we'd be irresponsible. But when we talk about them, the press get hold of them and then really run away with them. So these are things which are either longer term or less established. Um, start with uh, Gulf Stream collapse. Um, the idea is we do see in some of the model simulations the Gulf Stream slows down. I'm just like, how long have I been, Peter? You have plenty of time. Yeah, OK. Um, and I think the you know, people confused observations of the strength of the Gulf Stream, which vary a lot from year to year, with indication that it was going to collapse. I think now, certainly, simulations go up to the end of the century. They show a slowing down of that, this circulation, but not a complete collapse. Now, that does have some effects, because it means the ocean isn't warming up as much as the land, and that can affect how much water you get in. It affects water resources, particularly over the Mediterranean, because, of course, all the moisture coming off the Atlantic is carried into southern Europe. And if you've got lower temperatures, less evaporation, it's going to reduce the effect of the sub rainfall. So it does have some effects, but it's, it's, not, it's not the day after tomorrow. Um, now, the second area is uh, Amazon dieback. And some of the early work we did in Hadley Center, uh, because the model produced with global warming quite a reduction in rainfall, hence a big reduction in the Amazon rainforest, hence uh, uh, more CO2 being less CO2 being taken out of the atmosphere, more being emitted. It was quite a strong po uh, positive feedback. It seems that that's less likely now. Antarctic ice shell, uh, melt, there's been some speculation that the West Antarctic in particular, the rate at which ice accelerates into the sea could increase, and that would lead to big changes in the sea level. That certainly seems unlikely, I guess, at least in the current century. Methane path rate instability. Um, there are frozen deposits of methane in Siberia and also some of the shallow oceans. And if you heat those up, then you're going to start emitting methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So there is some evidence that that is happening. Uh, but I don't think it's catastrophic, but it's something we have to keep an eye on. And finally, the one thing I think which is an issue is Greenland ice sheet. Um, it's more not so much about what's happening over Greenland. And you may have seen pictures of you know, water disappearing down into uh, the ice sheet and the idea it might lubricate the bottom of the ice sheet. I think now they realize that probably happens all the time. What's probably more important is where these ice streams come out into the ocean and they're pinned uh, by local islands and so on. So there may be some acceleration of that. Um, and, but again, it's not something that's going to happen quickly. If you melted all the ice in Greenland, you get something like, I think it's about a five meter rise in sea level. Uh, but that's not going to happen. Uh, it would take probably several hundred years to do that. One thing that does seem to be true, this modeling evidence suggests if you move the, sea, the ice over Greenland, it would be quite difficult to get it back again. So that's the longer, less well, well established changes. Um, this shows changes in rainfall from a number of models. Uh, blue is wetter, brown is drier. And basically, you could probably summarize this up by saying that Wet areas get wetter and dry areas get drier. It's not as simple as that. The stippling here, which you may not see at the back, and there are white areas. The white areas are where there's very little agreement between models. And you can see the large areas that grow that are white, and we don't know what the rainfall changes will be. High latitudes, particularly in winter, there seems to be more agreement. And of course, rainfall may be one of the changes in rainfall, may have one of the main sources of impacts. Right, I promised I'd say a little bit about recent results, um, observations. Uh, in 2007, when there was a very small uh, coverage of ice in the Arctic, there was a lot of speculation that the disappearance of summer ice in the Arctic was accelerating. Uh, you can see in 2010, it's come back to a certain extent. And again, this just happens to be a warm year. The weather was such that the ice was less than average, and that gave the impression of an acceleration. I think some people think it looks as if the ice is going a bit quicker than the models predict but not in the catastrophic rate that this uh, particular year might have indicated. So again, you have to be very careful that what you're looking at one year is due to just changes in circulation, particularly at the local level, uh, and it's not uh, associated with longer-term climate change. Now, one of the things I talked a bit about um, 
Amazon dieback. <coughs> and to model that, you need to couple in uh, the biosphere, so the forests, uh, plants, and so forth, and also the same in the ocean. Um, and we're also coupling chemistry into models because for things like methane, that's important. I just want to show a, a, just a first result from uh, oops, the uh, new version of the Hadley Center model, which has much improved representation of biology. Um, and what we've run, a series of simulations. This is CO2 concentration running up to 2100. And IPCC has produced a new set of uh, representative concentration profiles. So this red one, if you like, is a business as usual, burn a lot of carbon profile, and it gets concentrations up to 900 parts per million by the end of the century. This is where we try and reduce emissions, uh, and the concentrations actually start to come down. When you run this in Hadley Center model, and of course, the exact numbers here will vary from model to model. You get the ongoing warming with this, which is no surprise. And it just turns out that this is sufficient to keep the warming down to two degrees in this particular model. A different model might give you either a greater or lesser warming. But it's, it's pretty well in the middle of the uh, park. The important thing about this is that we've prescribed the CO2 concentrations. But because we include the wave vegetation and so on, we can work out what the emissions, the anthropogenic emissions, would be to get this profile. And you can see that's the green curve here with both the full model and the simple model. And you almost have to get emissions down to zero to get this sort of concentration. So that, I think, is a, you know, a real issue for policy, how you get down to this. This would almost require some form of sequestration. Um, and this just shows the temperature changes for those two profiles. The uh, low emissions, something like 1 to 2 degrees of the UK and British Isles, and something more like 4 degrees with unmitigated emissions. Uh, now, the other thing, and then I probably need to draw things to close, um, as I've indicated, there's a considerable range of uncertainty in models. So just using a single model to develop policy is a bit foolish, really. And um, just to indicate this, first of all, this shows um, rainfall over England and Wales. So this, this is one of the most difficult things to uh, simulate. It's rainfall, which is difficult, and it's over a small area. And if you look at the red curves, this is percent of average. And you can see rainfall over England and Wales in summer varies by plus or minus 50%. So we're getting back to this natural variability versus long-term climate change. The blue curve shows a simulation, which we then run out with increases in greenhouse gases. And then we take in a number of different models. I think it's something like 17. You can probably see some gray curves. They're all superimposed. And again, you can see this large range of year-to-year -year variability. So the lesson of this is you can't just look at one year you know, a wet year or a dry year, and say that's due to climate change. And I actually showed this to Hillary Benn, because my concern is that sometimes politicians, every time there's a flood, it's global warming. Every time there's a drought, it's global warming. It's not as simple as that. When you average this, take 30-year averages. Oops. Come back. This is what you get. So you can see, you can sort of see these things as tending to get drier. When you do the 30-year averages, this is what you get. And probably if you're thinking of reservoirs or forests, they would probably notice this. But you won't notice it year to year. So, but one of the issues of this, because different models give different results, um, people have, we tried to, for the UK climate impacts problems to produce uh, probabilities rather than ranges of uncertainty. So the original climate impact program we had just used one model result. Um, the last IPCC report, you would get a range of changes in temperature or rainfall. Uh, and what we tried to do is see if we can look at a, a distribution. Now, this is very much a, in research mode uh, because they're not, this isn't a statistical distribution like tossing a dice where you expect you've got a model and you know what can be. It's, it gets into Bayesian statistics. And what this is really doing is saying, given the model and given observations, what's the most likely form of this distribution? So there's a lot of work to do there. And, but it does mean if you're planning a dam or something, you can then look at the, the, the risk of you know, big increases in temperature or rainfall or whatever you're interested in, or decreases and so on. So it enables you to do some kind of economic analysis of what the risk is. Oops. The final thing, um, one of the things that the Met Office has been involved in for many years, but now other uh, centers are taking up, is that we use the same set of equations for weather forecasting right through to climate. 
Uh, we may one run them at higher resolution uh, because we can afford to run weather forecast models. We're only running for a few days. Climate models we're running for, for centuries. And really bringing together weather forecasts, <laughs> seasonal forecasts, which although they're pretty hopeless in the extra tropics, are actually very good in the tropics. Um, we started looking at the cadal forecasts, which don't have a lot of skill, but are useful in it for a purpose I'll just tell you in a minute, and then climate prediction. So we can learn what's happening at the climate time scale by looking how well it does the weather events, how well it does some of the seasonal variations in the tropics and so on. So we're using gathering evidence right across the time scales to improve models. And just to let you look at what a, the game forecast looks like. So these are one, two, three, there's actually four forecasts there. This is a hindcast. So here is the, the black is the observations, 1985 to 1995. The red shows the range. These are probabilistic forecasts. So you'd hope most likely the temperatures would fall inside um, the red bands. Where it falls out is where Pinatubo came and cooled the climate. And that's the sort of thing we can't predict ahead of time. Similarly, uh, a forecast starting 1995 up to uh, 2005. The one area where the actual outcome was outside probable disease when we had this very big El Nino, which very, gave a very large warming. Uh, and this was the first forecast we did. Um, you can see it doesn't quite encapsulate the, the uh, lack of warning that we've seen over the last couple of years, but it is predicting it's going to go back again. So because these are probabilistic forecasts, you shouldn't look at the mean. In fact, this probably shouldn't be on it because it's misleading, but just look at the range. And the reason for, for doing decadal forecasts, although they don't have a lot of skill, uh, they can indicate sometimes when the short-term change will be different from the long-term climate change. And that's important for confidence in terms of your uh, looking at policy. So we know carbon dioxide is increasing uh, due to human activity. Uh, the enhanced greenhouse effect is real, and it will have a substantial effect. The plants warmed by about 0.7 degrees since the late 19th century. Um, in the near future, any long-term trend due to greenhouse gases will be obscured by natural fluctuation, such as we, we see outside. Um, most recent warming has been caused by increases in greenhouse gases. Um, the range of IPCC emission scenarios, you get a, a warming of about 1 to 6 degrees in global mean temperature by the end of the century. Um, and there's substantial regional and seasonal variations. And uncertainty is greater at the regional scale, which is why predicting impacts is difficult. And it's greater for rainfall and winds than for temperature. I was asked to say a little bit about climate gate. Um, and certainly, in my opinion, it was grossly overplayed. Um, and it did have an effect on public opinion. We've seen that in a opinion polls in the UK. But fortunately, science, physical science doesn't know about opinion polls, and that hasn't changed. And a lot of the basics, uh, in fact, were established 20 to 30 years ago. So a lot of this is not actually new science. Um, one of the good things that has been moved to make data more easily available, but one of the things we come up against is that MET services sometimes uh, depend on selling observational data to make revenue. And not all countries have made the data available. Um, and that's been a, a, an issue. I would say that uh, impacts are more difficult to predict than basic climate science. Oh, just one point I should make about this. I estimate that there's something like 80,000 references over the four IPCC reports and the three different uh, 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 working groups. So the climate science, the impacts, and the energy. So to have only one serious error, uh, and that was the uh, Himalayan glaciers, is actually not a bad record. If you've got something like a 0.01 or 0.01% error rate, I think most people would be happy with that. I'm not making excuses for it. It shouldn't have happened. But it was a very small amount of errors. And a lot of errors that were reportedly made, I know the Sunday Times had to issue an apology. I think it was something on the tropical forests. Um, so a lot of what was being said turned out not actually to be true. And for more information, we have actually a, a, pro a brochure for the um, current COP in uh, Mexico, and you can get more information on that. I suspect it's been a little bit longer than I should have been, no but uh, questions. Very good. Is it best if I sit down here? <laughs>